Good day, grade 11s. Um, I hope you've had a good day and that you have um, have had a good week so far. It's Thursday, yay, it's Thursday. And in this lesson, we're going to be talking about, we've gone past electronegativity and we're actually talking about intermolecular forces. Remember last lesson, we were working on electronegativity and we were moving on to intermolecular forces. Well, this lesson we're moving, we're carrying on with intermolecular forces. And um, I actually want to start with a slide that we left off of um, because of the fact that some of you may not remember. I mean, it is quite a long break between, when did we do this Tuesday? Okay, it's not such a long break between Tuesday and Thursday, but it is quite a long break between Thursday and Tuesday. So, um, I'm going to be going through this with you and then I've got quite a few videos to show you which I'm quite excited about. So let's get started. Okay, first of all, we went through these type of dipole, iron dipole, dipole, dipole um, bonding or intermolecular forces. And remember I said here there was a big difference between intermolecular forces, intermolecular and intramolecular forces. Um, intramolecular forces. Um, okay, just a second. I just need to switch my cell phone on silent and just check the bus is not responding to me. Okay, um, just a second. Um, just a second. I'll be back in the Right, sorry about that. Okay, cell phone and silent, not the boss, the life is cool. I always worry that it's the boss coming to tell me that he can't hear me or there's something wrong with that uh, um, internet connection or something like that. So I apologize for the delay. Okay, so remember I told you there was a difference between intermolecular and intramolecular. And intermolecular was basically, um, you need to think of it as um, between molecules, between molecules. Okay, and that's what we're talking about at the moment. And intra is within the molecules, within the molecules. And the intramolecular forces, remember, are actually not forces, they're actually bonds. And we're looking at, this would be your ionic, your covalent, and your metallic. And we are talking about the intermolecular forces, which are going to be things like your London forces, your hydrogen bonding, and your van der Waals forces. And remember we spoke about an iron dipole force. We spoke about um, an iron-induced dipole, 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 dipole-induced dipole, and momentary dipole for dipoles. And we're actually going to be talking about those in much more detail during this lesson. Okay, so the last three, this one, dipole, dipole, dipole induced dipole, and momentary dipoles are called van der Waals forces. And remember I said to you that you need to be careful with this phrase because in the previous curriculum and up to recently, the examiners were very happy with you calling things van der Waals forces, but now they actually want you to be way more specific and pedantic in your exams. So if they ask you to identify, you actually need to say they're London forces. And why? Because London forces are the most temporary of all the van der Waals forces, okay? So you need to say things that this is a London force, okay? But we'll talk about that in a bit. Right. So let's talk iron dipole, okay? So like I said, we're going to go through these, okay? So iron dipole, for example, your sodium chloride in water, okay, what happens is your sodium chloride, when it dissolves in water, breaks up into Na plus ions and Cl minus ions. Now, that is obviously an ion. An ion is an atom that has lost or gained 
electron charge. Let's call it charge, gain charge, because it might be one, two or more electrons, or you know, one or more electrons. Okay, so you've got the sodium plus ion, which is obviously lacking in electrons, and the chloride ion, which has got extra electrons, okay? Then you've got the water molecule, which is a polar molecule, and therefore it's dipolar. It's got, if you have to, if I had to draw it over here, it would be oxygen, and I'm going to draw it very basically that this is um, like this, and this is like this. This is oxygen, that's a hydrogen, and that's a hydrogen. Now what happens is the way this works is the oxygen has got a high electronegativity, very slightly higher electronegativity than the hydrogens. So it's going to be slightly negative, and the hydrogens are going to be slightly positive. So this is called a polar molecule, okay? It's polar because if I was coming from this direction, I would see it as slightly negative, and if I was coming from this direction, I would see it as slightly positive. Okay, so which is why it's called a dipole. A dipole because it's got two poles. It's polar. Okay, right. So now what happens is, if there's an ion dipole force, what happens is the chloride ion will come along and the water molecules will basically orientate themselves so that the slightly positive ends Okay, which is the hydrogens, will face the chloride ions. And this is actually what happens when the sodium chloride dissolves in the water. The chloride ions get totally surrounded, and you have to think 3D. Okay, we're obviously just drawing this 2D at the moment. So, uh, so they get totally surrounded by water molecules with the hydrogens facing inwards because of them being slightly positive and the chloride being a nice negative ion. Similarly, the sodium plus ion is going to be surrounded by water molecules, but this time the oxygen is going to be facing, the oxygen end is going to be facing the sodium plus ions because the oxygen end is slightly negative, okay? So it's going to be attracted to the big sodium plus ion. And that's how sodium chloride or table salt dissolves in water. Another example, which we have spoken about is iron induced dipoles, okay? So what happens is, and this is quite cool, okay? Wait, sorry, oops. <laughs> okay, what happens is this. You have an ion, okay? So it might be a positive ion or a negative ion, okay? So let's just say that it is a positive ion, okay? There's a picture, it's a positive ion. Now, it comes along near a dipole, okay? A dipole. Now, a dipole, um, Okay, it comes near an atom, not necessarily a dipole. It comes near an atom or a molecule that is maybe nonpolar. In fact, it probably is nonpolar. Okay, beautifully nonpolar. The electrons are flowing through wonderfully. Okay, but as this big positive ion comes close to this pure little neutral molecule, what happens? All the electrons get ex excited and they go, oh, look, a big positive, and they get attracted to the negative end of the this molecule. So very temporarily, just while this positive ion is going past it, okay, this is very temporary. All of these uh, forces are temporary forces, okay? So you can think of it as almost like, it sounds silly, but think of it as like there is a cool, hot, guy walking past and you know how then when you've got a really cool hot person walking past everybody's eyes swivel okay well that's effectively what's happening here except the electrons are moving so you can think that here is this big positive ion come past going okay right and as it's coming past what happens is all the little electrons get attracted okay to this side of the neutral molecule what happens then is that there is an excess of electrons on this side so this side looks slightly negative and because there's a lack of electrons this is slightly positive grade 11s do not tell me that the protons move to the side because they don't the poor protons in the middle okay they haven't moved at all they're still in the nucleus going hello what's going on okay they nothing's happened with them okay they're in the middle the electrons are the ones that are all a flurry okay Okay, now exactly the same thing could happen, but in the opposite direction, if this dude here was a negative ion. Okay, if this dude was a big negative ion, what would happen? Okay, what would happen is that these little negative electrons would be repelled. 
okay, because they've got the same charge. So because they repel, they're all going to move over to very temporarily, temporarily going to get repelled and be moved over to this side of the molecule. So for a very short period of time, this side is going to be slightly negative, and because this is lacking in electrons, this is going to be slightly positive. Okay, and that's the ion-induced dipole force. That's all it is. Okay, moving on. Dipole, dipole forces. Okay, so so far, just, just go back. This is when we actually have a real ion and a real dipole. Okay, this is when we have an ion and a neutral atom or molecule. Okay, and then what happens is that it induces a dipole. It makes it to be a dipole. Okay, that's what induces mean. It kind of forces it or makes it to be a dipole for a very short period of time. Okay. Now let's talk about dipole, dipole forces. This is when we have two dipoles. Okay, and when they come into contact with each other or just come close to each other, close to each other, they don't actually have to be in contact. Okay, the pole of one molecule is going to be attracted to the pole of the other. In other words, the positive pole, the, but this only works if they're oppositely, oppositely charged. If this was slightly negative and this is slightly positive, and this here is slightly positive and this is slightly negative, then obviously they're going to repel each other. They're not going to attract each other, okay? Okay, but if they are oriented, oriented in the correct direction, then what will happen is that they'll be held together in this way, which results, interestingly enough, in lower melting points and lower boiling points, okay? So examples of this would be hydrogen chloride. So for example, this would be H and that would be Cl and that would be H and that would be Cl. So that would be an example of your um, of your dipole dipole. Another example would be sulfur dioxide. So for example, here is SO2. The oxygens are slightly negative and the sulfur is slightly positive. So what would happen is here would be another S and there would be an O and an O. And there would be a slight attraction between this slightly positive and that slightly negative. And similarly, there may, might be another oxygen and oxygen to an S over there, and there'd be a slightly. So you can see that there forms almost like a little lattice shape going on here, okay? Ditto with your, this is called chloromethane, chloromethane. And you'll learn all about the alkanes and alkenes and alkynes next year if your teachers haven't taught you any organic chemistry yet. You don't need to know the name. You just need to understand that chlorine is slightly negative and your hydrogens are slightly positive, which again means that you can have something with a dipole come along or you can have another chlorine maybe. It might be like this. It might be Cl and then carbon and then hydrogen hydrogen and then hydrogen okay right and remember that this isn't planar okay this is at an angle okay right now let's talk induced dipole forces so induced means again that they've been made they are temporary very temporary more temporary than the ones that don't have induced in front of them okay they are temporary induced dipole forces Okay, so what you need to understand is induced double forces are the reason we can freeze nonpolar molecules such as carbon dioxide. Okay, let me explain that to you. Okay, so what happens is I'm first going to explain this and then we'll go through the words, okay? Well, let me explain you. In nonpolar molecules, electronic charge is evenly distributed. Okay, so let me explain. And I've kind of explained this to you anyway. Okay, but let me choose a different color. And let's talk. Okay, so do you agree that normally we've got some atoms with some electrons flowing around? Okay, la 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 la, the electrons are flowing around. La 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 la. Outer electron shell. Okay, inner electron shells as well, but let's talk about the outer ones. Ditto, yeah. La 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 la. Okay, right. So I need to look a little bit like an eyeball. But anyway. Okay, so now what happens is they are, and this for example might be part of an ideal gas. Okay, so they might not be attracted to anything ever. Okay, but what happens if, if this, let's pretend that this is hydrogen atom and this is a hydrogen atom. Okay, what happens if at some point, just have a look, this dude's electron is on this side. 
Okay, you can't really see that. Let's change color. This dude's electron has happens to be on this side. Okay, so if that's the case, if it's hydrogen, it means it's got one electron and one proton. Okay, so in that case, at that instant, this will be slightly negative and this will be slightly positive. Okay, now if it comes close to this dude, okay, it doesn't matter where that dude's electron is, right? Because this is slightly negative and slightly positive, it forms kind of this shape going on here, okay? Because the negative is, let's just say that, yeah, never mind. That's talking, the reason I've done that shape is because of the density of the electrons. They're showing you that there are more electrons on that side, okay? So this side is slightly negative and this side is slightly positive, right? So what's going to happen? If it's slightly positive, it's going to attract the electrons over onto this side. Okay, now admittedly, if this is hydrogen, there's exactly one electron for it to attract. So it's going to attract its electron over onto the side. Okay, so then and the, you must understand this is happening so fast because this electron's moving. Okay, this electron's still coming around. Okay, so this is only while this electron's on the other side of the atom. And again, remember to think 3D. Okay, so this is only while this electron's on this side of the atom. So what happens is because this electron's on the side, this side is slightly negative and this side is slightly positive, which means for a very short period of time, that slightly positive side, that slightly positive side, attracts the electron on this atom to the side. So for a very short period of time, this atom looks like this, where it is slightly negative on this side and slightly positive on this side, okay? And then it's slightly negative on the side and slightly positive on the side. But when I'm talking about short periods of time, I'm talking instantaneous, like that. Like that. That is how quickly it works, okay? And if you blink, you miss it, okay? So that's how quickly this happens. And it only happens if, if this actual atom kind of has its electron on this side already. So if this one's electrons were on the other side, by the time this one's electrons came to this side, this one's electrons will have moved already. So it can only work if this electrons were already kind of in the vicinity to be attracted to the side. Okay, do you understand that? So, like we said, in non-polar molecules, the electronic charge is evenly distributed. Okay, but... Sometimes electrons might not be evenly distributed, as I've shown you, okay? The molecule will have a temporary dipole, very temporary. We're talking seriously an instantaneous dipole almost, okay? When this happens, it very weakly attracts the molecules next to it, very weakly attracts the molecules next to it. And examples of this tend to be your diatomic molecules, such as your fluorine, and your iodine, as well as carbon dioxide, as well as carbon tetrachloride. Now, obviously, fluorine and iodine are, di are um, non-polar molecules because of the fact that they are obviously diatomic molecules. These are diatomic molecules, so therefore they are non-polar because they've got exactly the same electronegativities. Carbon dioxide is interesting. I'm just going to draw the electronic structure of carbon dioxide just to show you. So I'm just going to go up for a second so that you can have C space. And I'm going to erase some stuff so there's space. Okay, so if you remember from our Lewis structures, your carbon dioxide works like this. Remember carbon special, it's in group four. So normally we'd expect carbon to go one, two, three, four. But remember carbon gets excited and it jumps up to the next energy level. So what happens is carbon actually does that. Okay. And then oxygen's in group six. Remember that oxygen's in group six. So if it's in group six, it's got six electrons. So oxygen is, oh, I hate when it does that, just a second. Oxygen is in group six. It's got six valence electrons. It's got one, two, three, four, five, and six. So there's a space here and a space here. So what happens is the carbon, and I'm going to draw it over here, one, two, three, and four, joins up with the oxygen. Let's see if I can get this right. It goes like this. 
and then it goes one two and then it goes three four five six so there's two shared pairs of electrons here similarly the other oxygen fits in over here okay and again one two three four five six so do you see this is a beautiful linear molecule beautiful linear molecule and because it's a linear molecule if I come from this side I'm going to see it as having an oxygen and if I come from that side I'm going to see it as having an oxygen and overall it is going to be non-polar non-polar okay similarly with carbon tetrachloride carbon tetrachloride okay we're speaking about CCL4 CCL4 Okay, so again, your carbon has got one, two, three, four. Chlorine is in group seven, so it's going to have seven valence electrons. So it's going to be one, okay, wait, CL. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And again, it goes, oh, one, two, three, four, five, six, and then one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and then one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So you can see that no matter which way I approach, the carbon tetrachloride is going to have the same charge. And in fact, the way carbon tetrachloride looks, if I had to draw it, and I'm going to try and draw it, yeah, it's a carbon, and there would be a chlorine over here, a chlorine over here, a chlorine over here, and then you have to think 3D, it goes back into the page like a little tripod, it's chlorine over here. So therefore, no matter which way I approach this thing, I am seeing a chlorine molecule, chlorine atom, and therefore I can say that it is non-polar in nature. Okay, right, so now let's talk dipole-induced forces. So again, dipole induced dipole. Okay, so again, we've spoken about, let's just go through this. I just want to make sure you guys understand what I'm talking about because this is important, okay? We've spoken about iron dipoles. So that's when you have an actual iron and an actual dipole. Then we've spoken about iron induced. This is when you have an ion, you bring a closer neutral atom and you make it a dipole. We've spoken about dipole, dipole, okay? We've now spoken about... I think we're about to talk about dipole induced dipole. So let's go talk to you about dipole. Yeah, we're going to speak about dipole induced dipole forces. This type of force occurs when a molecule with a dipole induces a dipole in a non polar molecule. So, for example, this here. So let's just watch this. So, yeah, you've got oxygen, which is a normal non-polar molecule okay and you've got water which is polar okay now when the water molecule comes close to this this oxygen is positively charged okay so because it's positively charged it, it scares the electrons okay wait oh shit okay sorry sorry i shouldn't swear okay let me see if i can catch it so what happens is you can see that the oxygen atoms got the electrons um, oxygen molecules flowing through and everything else I'm just going to pause it okay so what's happening at this point is that the oxygen is slightly positive I mean slightly negative and the hydrogens are slightly positive okay because this is slightly negative it repels all the electrons over onto that side okay now let's see if I can get this right I just want to stop it where it shows the delta positive delta. Oh. Okay, well, let me just draw it. So then this is exactly what happens. You've got that this is no dipole. This is slightly negative, and that is slightly positive and slightly positive. And for that reason, as it comes closer, it causes the electrons. Let's just watch it once more. It causes the electrons all to be chased onto the other side. So this end will become slightly negative, and this end will become slightly positive. So if we do that again... There we go. Let me just pause it. Now, this side here is slightly positive. I did it again. Slightly negative, okay? This is slightly positive. This is slightly positive. Because of the fact that these are slightly negative, 
it repels the electrons onto the other side of this obviously non-polar molecule. I mean, for heaven's sakes, grade 11, it's diatomic. If it's diatomic, it means that it should be non-polar. But now, very temporarily, because it's moved closer, all the electrons are being, most electrons, most of them are being pushed over to the side. So this becomes slightly negative, and then because of a lack of electrons on the side, this becomes slightly positive, okay? So you can see that that is exactly what is happening here. Okay, right, so now that I've drawn all over it, let's just clear the erase the writing. Okay, so you can see that this happens when a molecule with a dipole, i.e. the water, induces a dipole in the non-polar molecule. Okay, you get it. Right, now let's talk hydrogen bonds. First of all, hydrogen bonding is a misnomer because we're calling it bonding when we're actually talking what? We're talking intermolecular forces, okay, forces. Bonds tend to mean that the atoms tend to change their structure by breaking something and moving something around, whereas hydrogen bonding is just a hydrogen force, okay, but nevertheless it's called hydrogen bonding, okay. So it occurs, and guys you need to know this, this is so important, it's ridiculously important. Okay, it occurs when a molecule contains a hydrogen atom that is covalently bonded to a highly electronegative atom, and they're supposed, supposed to have written small atom, yeah, small atom. And they give you always examples, oxygen, nitrogen, fluorine. You guys are only going to worry about hydrogen bonds between hydrogen and molecules that have oxygen, nitrogen, and fluorine in them, okay? You guys need to know this definition, so let's go through it again. It's when a molecule containing a hydrogen atom is covalently bonded to a highly electronegative atom, then that hydrogen atom, will there will be hydrogen bonding occurring. Okay, and I'll give you an example in a minute. So here, for example, you have got a water molecule and a water molecule, okay? The hydrogen is covalently bonded, this is polar covalent, okay, to a highly electronegative atom, so this is oxygen, nitrogen, fluorine, okay, and then what happens is this hydrogen bonding occurs, and what actually happens is that the oxygen is slightly negative and the hydrogen is slightly positive. So there ends up being this force of attraction between this hydrogen and that oxygen, okay? And in water, it's actually very important because it actually changes the temperature at which it melts and the temperature at which it freezes. So let's watch this little video on hydrogen bonding. Oh wait, let me just get rid of the writing. Okay, let's try again. So again, we're looking at hydrogen and nitrogen, hydrogen and oxygen, and hydrogen and fluorine. Obviously, this could be anything. There could be a whole big molecule here, or there could be whatever, okay? So now we're talking about hydrogen fluoride, fluorine specifically. Now, the fluorine we know has got a very high electronegativity. So for that reason, it pulls the electron off the hydrogen, totally pulls it off, okay? We know that fluorine's got an electronegativity of four. It's the highest one, okay? So you end up with a molecule that looks a little bit like this because, let me just pause this for a second. Okay, wait. Hydrogen is made up of what? Hydrogen is only made up of, let me just write this up. Hydrogen is made up of a proton and an electron. That's all hydrogen is. We're not talking any of its um, deuter deuterium and tritium, or whatever. We're talking just about the hydrogen atom. It's made of one proton and one electron. If this electron is being attracted to the fluorine so that it spends way more time around the fluorine than it does around the hydrogen, because that's what's happening, because the fluorine has got such a high electronegativity, this hydrogen is now basically a hydrogen ion, okay? So therefore, this side looks slightly positive which means that this side is obviously slightly negative because it now has got that extra electron that was flowing around the hydrogen. Okay, let's continue. So 
So then what happens is you end up with what is called hydrogen bonding, which is really a force of attraction between the slightly positive end of the one molecule and the slightly negative end of the other molecule. Okay, and that's basically hydrogen bonding, okay, between hydrogen and fluoride. Okay. So we're going to talk about why hydrogen bonding and all these other things is important when we talk about properties of um, substances with respect to their bonds. Okay, hydrogen bonding plays a huge, huge role in your organic chemistry that you will be learning either later this year or beginning of next year. So please make sure that you know what hydrogen bonding is, okay? Right, moving on. So let's talk about the effects of the intermolecular forces. Intermolecular forces affect the macroscopic behavior of the substances. Now, before we carry on, let's talk macroscopic versus microscopic. Microscopic is we can't see. Okay? We can't see with the naked eye. Macroscopic is we can see. Okay, so the macroscopic behavior of the substances would be something that we can notice, such as its hardness or its softness or the color or a phase change or things like that. Okay, whereas microscopic, we can't see. Okay, so yeah. Okay, so macroscopic is on the big side and microscopic is on the small side. So they're saying that intermolecular forces affect the macroscopic behavior of substances. In other words, it affects the things that are obvious to us that we can see, okay? So if a substance has weak intermolecular forces, what's going to happen? First of all, do you agree it'll evaporate easily? Think about it. If it has weak intermolecular forces and evaporation occurs, okay, now before we carry on again, I need to explain the difference between evaporation versus boiling because I find that a lot of my metrics don't know the difference between evaporation and boiling and it's an important concept, okay? Evaporation is basically when you have a container that has a liquid of some sort. And what happens is, as you know, there are particles that are moving along, okay, with Brownian motion. And they've got a kinetic energy and they've got an EK, kinetic energy. And what is happening is sometimes when the particles have enough kinetic energy, they will break free of the forces of forces of cohesion. I'll explain that in a second. And they will become a vapor. Okay. And usually with evaporation, we're talking about the particle becoming a vapor and hanging just above the surface of the container. Okay. So basically what we're saying is that evaporation is a natural thing that happens when we have a liquid that is going to, because remember that all particles in a liquid will have some kinetic energy. And as they, the particle, the liquid stands there, the particles are zooming around, zing, 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 okay? And sometimes when a particle hits the surface of the earth, at the surface of the liquid, surface of the earth, surface of the liquid, it might just have enough energy to break free from the forces of attraction that are from the other water molecules or other liquid molecules, okay? So that's the forces of cohesion. The forces of cohesion are the forces of attraction between the particles. And that's what makes surface tension, okay? Now, sometimes we will notice that there's more evaporation than at other times. And the reason will be possibly because the surrounding air or the sun might, might be warmer, for example, or the sun might be shining. And what is happening then is that the warmth from the air or the warmth from the sun will, or the, connect, or the UV rays from the sun, the energy from the sun, will provide some of the particles with extra kinetic energy, which means that they will then break free. Okay, do you understand that? Whereas boiling, Boiling is different. Boiling is when we have an external source of heat, okay? Boiling is when we have an external source of heat. We take a container 
and we put it over a flame or on a gas cooker or whatever. And what we do is we excite the molecules in the liquid so much so that they're able to break free, but then they don't just break free and hover just above the surface like evaporation does. They break free and keep going, zing, 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 which is why we end up with things like steam when we're boiling, whereas with evaporation, we don't actually see it happening. We might, after a period of time, notice that the level of the liquid has, I don't know, decreased a little bit, Okay, it might have decreased a little bit. And the reason for this is because evaporation has occurred. With boiling, however, we will definitely see a change. And more importantly, we'll have steam moving out and transferring into the atmosphere and keep on going. The only way we can get this liquid back, okay, because it's happening in such a fast reaction, is to put a lid on it. If we put a lid on it, then it'll cause this liquid to condense and go back into solution. Whereas with evaporation, there is an opportunity if, because this evaporation happens quite slowly, there is an opportunity to put a hold to it by either closing this container, okay, or maybe putting it somewhere like in the fridge or somewhere cold where the change in its temperature of the atmosphere doesn't pay, make a, play a role, okay. So there you go. Now you know the difference between evaporation and boiling. Now, having said that, if a substance has got a weak intermolecular forces, then obviously it's going to be easier to overcome the forces of, of cohesion, which is the forces that keep these particles together on their surface, and it'll be able to break free to form part of the gas. Okay, so that there is the fact that it, in, it will evaporate easily. It has low surface tension on the same principle, okay? It's got low surface tension, which means that there is a low for sense of attraction, low, low, okay, let's try again. There are small forces of attraction between the particles, which have got weak intermolecular forces versus particles that have got strong intermolecular forces. So, a typical example is when water, if, and you guys have seen this, if you've ever taken a straw and popped it into a juice, I'm not talking about a fizzy drink where it makes it pop back up, I'm talking about anything, okay, like put it in a water glass, and what you'll notice is that the water will crash up, okay, and it will end up higher than the rest of the container, okay. And I don't know if you guys ever did this, but I did it when I was a kid. Um, you then take your finger and you try and trap the bubble or trap the water in the tube. And never mind, it's not important. Okay, so the point is that this bit here, yeah, this is called cap capillarity. 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 And capillarity has to do with the forces of, of adhesion and forces of cohesion. Now, let me just explain that to you because it's important. If you look at this, this water is being pulled up and you'll notice that there is a little bit of an increase on the sides. Okay, so let me just draw this for you bigger. Okay, so what happens is on your surface and in the rest of the liquid, your particles have got been attracted to other particles. Okay, the particles of your liquid are being attracted to other particles all the time. Okay, but they've been attracted to each other, so life is cool, especially in the middle. Okay, however, at the surface, okay, do you agree that there's a force of attraction down and next to each other? Okay, there's force of attraction down and there's forces pulling it down. Okay, do you agree? So what we're saying is that but, oh, sorry, on the sides, there's forces of what are called adhesion, which is the force between the glass or color container and the fluid. Okay. Now, depending on the surface tension or how strongly these um, how strong the intermolecular forces are, okay, will show how high this rises. So if there is a low surface tension, then this isn't going to rise very strongly. Where if there's a high surface tension, the force of this is going to be very strong, which means you end up 
with the thing that looks like this. So it'll look much more like this, okay? Because there are strong forces, uh, intermolecular forces holding this down, okay? Right, now, obviously then the boiling point, okay, let me just wait, 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 I forgot to say about mercury. If you've ever looked at mercury in a, in a little beaker, or not a beaker, um, Ha, oh, tube. You will notice that mercury does this. And mercury is the only one that does this that we know of. Okay. Mercury, remember, is the only metal that is liquid at room temperature. The only metal that is liquid at room temperature. And for a very long time, they used that. Um, in thermometers, they don't do more because mercury is quite toxic. Okay, now the reason for this shape is because the forces of cohesion, the forces between the type of the atoms or the yeah in the mercury, are stronger than the forces between the atoms in the glass. Okay, so grade eleven, so we're going to carry on with this on Tuesday. I hope you've had a great day, and I hope that I will see you on Tuesday. Have a great day. Cheers. Oh, wrong one. Sorry.